So now we're going to look at the second of the two effects that are in that short uh, segment, which is the ice growing over uh, the letters. So let's have a look at the letters first. Here they are. And uh, what we're doing is taking our letters, which are in a file, we're subdividing them because that will allow us to, we're going to need plenty of polys for that to work. So let me just uh, show you this. Um, there we go. So we start off with these letters like this, and then we subdivide. So we've got plenty of polys. I'm doing it twice. So there's a lot of polys there. Uh, and then I'm creating an empty attribute here called density. And then I'm getting an attribute from volume. And that's going to read in an attribute from a volume, which is attached to the second input here. Uh, and the volume I'm reading from is this merged in from another node. So let's have a look at the node that's generating that volume. Uh, and that's here, the animated volume node. So let me just rewind. Uh, and what we're doing here is taking a curve. we just got a curve. There it is. And then we're animating a carve sop. And what a carve sop does is allows you to cut a curve according to its U value. Now, as you know, a curve has a U value which goes from zero at one end to one at the other end. So we animate this. There we are. You can see that's 0.05. We're getting a little bit of a little bit of a curve. We animate this over the whole of our thing. You can see we're getting the curve like so. So the animation allows the curve to grow. Uh, and we've got the same thing happening here with a slightly different animation and a slightly different uh, curve. So that's doing that. And then I'm uh, converting these to lines to polylines. So let me give ourselves 40 frames or so. And then in each case, I'm polywiring them like this. So we get a nice big chunky object here, which is our polywire. Let me have a look at this. Uh, you can see. And I then transform that very slightly to go back. And if we have a look at uh, other stuff here, we can see that this is covering our letters, the front of our letters like so. Uh, and the other one is doing the same. So I then create a box which goes round our letters like so. And I use this to set the bounds for two volume creation SOPs. So these ISO offsets are creating volume out of that polywire and out of that other polywire. So I'm creating the volume and if I say override bounds then the volume is going to not be based on the on the geometry that's coming in here. It's going to use the bounds of this box uh, which is the box covering our, our letters. So we create a volume here. Let me just we can we can see it there uh, and we create a volume here and we can see that one uh, and then I there is, in fact, a, a, there are two volume mixes there. That's that's an error. In fact, this is uh, this is an error that uh, that should that should be connected into the volume burp. So let's get rid of that. So what we're doing here is taking our initial volume and adding two more to it. One of them is that other. So the two curves, and the, th the third one is this box. And what I've got is a box which is moving. Oops, the transform is animated. So the box moves in and covers our letters. And we're converting that to a volume as well. And uh, that should, in fact, also have the box as its uh, bounding. Ah, no, it doesn't need the box is bounding. That's right, because uh, uh, that would mean that the volume doesn't get created. So we then merge these all together, and we merge all the volumes, making sure that the max, we take the maximum of each one. And then as we go through here, we can see that uh, the volume grows and engulfs the letters. Very good. Uh, and then finally, what I do is blur uh, the volumes so that uh, we just don't go straight from 0 to 1. We, we have a nice soft edge to the volume so that it doesn't uh, sort of sharply go from being dense to not dense. And then we write them all out to disk.
And the reason we write them all out to disk is both because uh, that just saves time later on, uh, but also because we need to have them on disk for the next part of the simulation to work. So let's go back. Now we've had a look at that volume and we know what it is. Let's go back and have a look at what's happening to our letters, uh, which are here. So we're getting that density attribute from the volume. Uh, and so we should see here in the details view, we've got a density attribute. There we go. Uh, and some, some have a density of zero and others have a density here. And then I just use an attribute uh, wrangle to take a value away. Let's just expand this. So all this is doing is just adjusting this density value downwards by an amount and making sure that the range still retain, remains the same. Uh, that's what this little formula is doing here. So if I increase this, it's going to reduce the density down and that's going to affect later on the amount of ice that grows on those primitives. Now the density of course has come in as a, as a, a point attribute, uh, but we need to have it as a primitive attribute. So this attribute promote takes it, takes the minimum value of that uh, density attribute and promotes it into a primitive attribute. So if we have a look now, we can see we've got density there. And then I need to rename this to fur length because fur length is the attribute that the Houdini hair system or fur system expects to find on a primitive to tell it how much hair to grow on that primitive. Uh, and so uh, that uh, is where we are. And we can now go and have a look at the hair system or the fur system to see how that's being used. So at the end of this, we've got our geometry, our primitives with a fur length attribute. Now, by default, the fur system in Houdini expects to find a fur length attribute in order to tell it how much, how, how long the hair is that it's going to grow. And it does that, uh, it adjusts the, the length of hair here that you put in here, the length of fur here, by that attribute. And by the way, the other thing you, you need to do here is um, turn off the randomization of length. Otherwise, even where your hair is, hair length is zero, you still may get some, 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 some fur or some ice. So let's uh, let's zoom in on our, uh, oops, I didn't mean to do that. Let's zoom in on our geometry and uh, we may be able to see some fur in a minute when we move through. So as this goes through, there we go. As this goes through, those little yellow dots, you may not be able to see them very clearly that's some fur growing on there, which is what's going to become our ice. Now, out of the box, uh, this node doesn't allow you to animate the fur length attribute or, or to generate the fur length attribute outside of this network itself. So I've had to change the network. That's why this is red. And what you need to do is you need to dive down into it. And then uh, it's a very complicated network, but you didn't need to understand all of it. Uh, but you do need to go down into the skin node and you need to bypass both of these add fur length and the paint fur length nodes, which are the things that set up the fur length under the default system. And that way it doesn't overwrite them and it'll just read the fur length off uh, the primitives that you're generating in here. So what that's doing is that at every frame it's regenerating the fur and it's doing it according to the animated fur length attribute here. Uh, and that in turn is being generated from the volume. And uh, I should say, by the way, that uh, we've tweaked a little bit the appearance of these, uh, this fur. Where are we? Uh, let's find the fur again. So uh, the appearance is somewhere here. Uh, we set the color and so on. Where is it? The shader, the shader that, uh, uh, that uh, there we are. So we can go to the material and instead of it normally being sort of leopard skin pattern, I've just made it white and uh, turning to gray at the top. And I've made it quite uh, transparent as well. Sorry, this is the transparency. The, the diffuse is actually blue. The transparency is uh, going to gray. In other words, getting transparent at the top. Uh, and the, the basic thing is blue. So that's the, the hair that's being generated. And that will, because it's very short, That'll look like ice. 
And the second thing you will have noticed from that from that animation is that the letter to goes from red to blue as the as the ice approaches. And that's uh, another reason we needed to write those volumes out to disk because we've adapted one of the shaders here. Uh, the, let's have a look in the shop context actually. Um, we've got a shader here which is going to take account of those volumes. So let's zoom in. And what we're using is this thing called volume sample file. And that allows us to take a volume that's written out to a file on disk and find uh, the value of that volume at the particular point that we're currently shading. So we pick up the point that we're currently shading. Very important, it needs to be in world space. This object will, being, will be being shaded in object space, in camera space rather. So we need it in world space. Uh, the file name is just the, the file name of the, of the volume. And there's obviously a new volume file for each frame. We clamp it to make sure it's between zero and one. And then we use that to drive that uh, color ramp, a color ramp, which tells you the color of, it's going to tell you the color of the shading, the diffuse color of the, of the, uh, of, of the point we're shading. And the other thing we're doing up here is using that same value to mix two different specular angles so that the specular angle on the icy part will be different from the specular angle on the, uh, uh, the, the normal part. So if we have a look, uh, it's giving us an error. Um, this is giving us, not sure why it's giving us an error, but it's, it's working. So here we can see that diffuse ramp color that I was talking about. So the volume is where the, where the density is zero, we're going to get this, this red, reddish color. And where the density is greater than zero, we're going to go into this blue color. So it's going to start coloring things blue. And then we look at the reflectivity. Uh, there are two reflectivity angles, uh, specular angle normal, and then somewhere, not sure where that's gone, there will be another specular angle, which is for the icy part. And of course, the final thing we need is, is a volume to sample, and this parameter is up here, and that's pointing to the volume that we wrote out and it's going to be a different volume file for each frame so at each frame uh, the ice is going to grow so let's just see that at work so at frame one we just uh, render standard render at frame one we can see we just get the the standard xmas lettering we've got a little tiny bit of blue here just beginning of the volume and then if we get to say frame 50 uh, then there's uh, quite a bit of uh, blue and then at frame 72 um, more or less the whole of it is blue now you'll have noticed that we're not we're not we don't seem to be getting any ice on these letters the reason for that is because the ipr renderer isn't regenerating the geometry each frame it's just rerunning the shader so i need to hit render and that will regenerate the geometry and as you can see now give us the, the nice sort of ice particles here. Anyhow, I hope that's been useful. Uh, the uh, I should say, by the way, that the, the inspiration for this uh, tutorial was in fact a Grayscale Gorilla tutorial which looked at how to achieve the same effect in, in Cinema 4D. Of course, the, the method of doing so in Cinema 4D is rather different, but uh, I hope it's been useful to see how it's done in Houdini.